What's going on, guys? My name is Julian Young. I'm the founder of The Blockchain Brief, where every episode we are interviewing innovators and founders in the blockchain and crypto space. Today, I'm extremely excited to have Stuart Popjoy and Will Martino, the founders of Kadena. Uh, gentlemen, it is great to have you guys here today. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, so why don't we jump right into it? Uh, would you mind kind of giving a little bit of background on both yourselves as well as your team? Sure. So uh, I'm Stuart. This is Will. Uh, we were both at JP Morgan before we launched Cadena doing blockchain pilots. Um, I have a background in building uh, uh, trading systems and Will before that was at the uh, SEC. Helped found the group that uh, produced the DAO report and is now involved in many things involving tokens and ICOs. Um, and uh, we're both engineers. Uh, we're both, uh, we've built the software that we're deploying to our clients and we're doing this. Amazing stuff. So let's jump right into the problem, right? Like what are you guys looking to solve uh, and how big is, is sort of the market here? Uh, the problem is, the thing that we're solving is being able to actually handle what real adoption looks like. It's both on the public and the private side. More generally, the vision is that uh, now that we've had enough experimentation over the last eight years since Bitcoin came out, that we know what a system really is going to need to be adopted, both from being able to scale to having it be adopted widely for a bunch of projects. Very good. And so, so talk a little bit about how Kadena solves some of these problems. I dig it. Uh, Go ahead for it. Oh, well, so, uh, yeah. well, we have, we, there's, we have, there's multiple parts to our offering. Um, you know, the, the thing that ties it all together is we have a smart contract language called Pact, uh, which is much safer and much easier to use than any of the other solutions out there. Um, and, we're, and our goal is to make that a standard. Uh, and, you know, when we talk about public and private, we, we, we're not just talking about where we want it to be. We have a private blockchain that is in use at clients that are paying us revenues to use our software. And what we're building, ChainWeb, is a massive parallel public chain protocol that will also run our smart contract. Got it. Got it. And so you guys in your white paper, you call the solidity language dangerously unconstrained. Uh, would you mind ex explaining that a little bit more and, and why you believe that? And so why is PACT so different? Uh, the main reason why PACT is different than solidity is that PACT is focused on trying to make things easy for a developer to do. that makes sense to do on a blockchain where solidity wants to look like a general purpose programming language. And so the idea there is that uh, we feel that you don't just build anything on a smart contract application. You build smart contracts. Smart contracts are very specific. Um, there's things like date. You use things like databases. You use things like uh, public key authorization. And uh, whereas Solidity is just kind of designed to do anything. And, uh, and as a result, a lot of complexity can result, which can result in dangerous bugs and exploits. And so another thing that you mentioned right before this question was the fact that you guys are, are working on a private blockchain as well. Um, so I did notice from your white paper that uh, there is no mining um, in that. So could you explain how there is no mining or, or, or how that works? So uh, public and private context for blockchains have antithetical consensus needs. In private and public, it should be open. Anyone can participate. If you have a mining rig, you can go and try to mine a block. Whereas in private, uh, it is a very much a closed universe. People need to be signed in. So in our private system, we use a deterministic busy fault tolerant consensus algorithm uh, that's based off of Tangaroa, which was then, you know, uh, Juno came after that, which is what we open sourced to Hyperledger, Mary Jane Morgan, and Scale BFT is sort of the third generation of that system. Very good. So let's talk about practical use cases now, right? Like, so where would I be using your product? If you can walk me just through a couple examples, that would be great. So, um, again, we, it's good to look at both sides of the aisle here. Um, private, it's a lot of circumstances where you have like, uh, either you have a single business that wants to kind of be able to operate in a trustworthy manner with its partners, or you have a consortia where people who don't trust each other want to be able to trust the processes by which they're working together. So, uh, for instance, uh, we're working on a healthcare use case that is about solving the problem of public provider data. This is data that, has, that is always living in silos from organization to organization. And by putting a market around it and making it possible for people to purchase records and be able to trust, trust uh, the system to be able to offer a marketplace for better public provider data, they're gonna solve a problem that's costing them individually $15 million a year in costs and regulatory funds. 
Wow. Got it. Um, so I know that there's obviously no tokens on the private blockchain side, but would you kind of mind walking me through the, the token utility on the public side? The token utility is uh, very similar, exactly the same actually to Ethereum's. Um, you can, it's used to pay for computation. Uh, so you, know, you have your smart contracts uh, that has a meter attached to it and you need to actually pay for the execution of that and the storage of that on the blockchain itself. Very good stuff. And so I did also remember reading somewhere in your white paper that uh, your project is Turing incomplete. Can you kind of help me better understand that a little bit more? That, that's a, it's actually a more minor detail than it sounds. Um, okay. It basically means that the language doesn't allow you to, to, for functions to get into infinite loops. Got it. Okay. Um, and it, it, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you can't call functions. It doesn't mean that you can't loop. You can do all the things that you can do in, in most normal cases. Well, the kinds of things you can't do are specifically like compute an option price or do these kinds of like uh, analytical activities that, you know, that where you probably want to be doing that off chain anyway, because it'd be very expensive. Here's an example. If, if you had a smart contract that was going to try to find the best route from San Francisco to LA or something, well, that's pretty easy, but San Francisco to, you know, New Mexico or something, you wouldn't really want to be doing that computation on the blockchain. So the idea is that, you know, you might secure the transaction on the blockchain and then do an oracle process to compute this, you know, expensive computation. And that's the kind of thing that is infeasible to do in fact. Sure, sure. And, and so, so what are some other reasons why people might want to build on top of Kadena as opposed to building on Ethereum? Maybe you want to upgrade your smart contracts. <laughs> There's a bunch of it. Uh, we'll be uh, the first open source version of the uh, home verification system that we demoed at BPACE in 2017 should be uh, published in about a month, probably a little bit less. Okay. Um, you, so you have that, you have, have you, know, you actually integrate with traditional databases. So you don't have to, um, you don't have any this problem where you uh, put all your data into something level BB and then you have a hard time getting it out. Yep. You're to Postgres, SQL Server, all that stuff. Another point is that it's actually much easier to read than other smart contract languages and the, and the code you write is the code that goes on chain. So if, if it's important that multiple stakeholders in your organization really understand the code that's running, Pact is a huge advantage. And by being easy to read, it makes it easier to develop in and easier for developers to learn. The, the, the target developer for Pact is not like a seasoned application developer. It's even somebody who's good with Excel. Wow, oh, okay, makes sense. Um, and so let's talk progress, right? Like you guys have been working on this for quite some time now. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about milestones? Um, I don't know if you can share any partners that you guys are currently working with, but anything along the realm of, of the progress that you guys have made since the beginning? Uh, so we, uh, so part of the code base started with um, the consensus layer. Uh, so when we were at Chicken Morgan, we got to open source Juno, and they actually had to assign ownership rights to me. So that formed the basis of scalable BFT. That has been out in uh, development at our Fortune 100 client for around six, nine months at this point. We've worked with it, about four or five different teams have used it at this point. Um, we've actually never run into a development team that has taken longer to learn Pact than a couple of weeks, interestingly enough. Um, Pact was open source a year and a half ago, I think. It's on version two. We'll probably push the version three before release. Uh, and Chainweb, we are building up a team around that. The protocol and the simulations are coming along. The protocol paper was published. Uh, we don't. We suspect that it'll be in testing sometime in the summer, probably late in August, and then launch a few months later. Very good. So guys, again, I really appreciate you taking the time to jump on this call and kind of telling our viewers more about this. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to share before we sign off here? I'd like to get Will to talk a little more about Chainweb and just some of the things that are unique about it. I, I, Cause we've been focused kind of more on the smart contract level. Um, but I'll kick it off just quickly, which is um, just some of the things about uh, it being what makes it different from other scaling solutions for public blockchain for you know, Coinbase. Mm -hmm. So one of the uh, interesting things of Chainweb is that it has, so if you assume, uh, so 90, 95% of the uh, actual resources used by uh, consensus participants, this would be miners on the public side, uh, goes to the actual active mining, the electricity that goes into it. The, one of the interesting parts of Chainweb is that you can hard fork from smaller to larger configurations without actually increasing the energy usage or actually the cost of uh, being an operator of the consensus layer very much. That's because the uh, amount of the hash rate stays the same and all you need to do is go and uh, grab some extra servers to do uh, a little bit more replication. So let's say you go from 100 chains to 1,000 chains in parallel. 
you need some more servers to replicate that, but the costs are still strictly dominated by electricity. So it'll allow us to launch at a smaller configuration, say like a you know, thousand transactions a second globally replicated. And then as the system starts to be uh, utilized more and more, let's say it's on average 200, 500 a second that's getting used, we can hard fork up to a larger uh, throughput or a larger uh, throughput uh, configuration for the system. And this is actually in the interest of the uh, users because they uh, don't have to pay congestion fees like you see here in Bitcoin um, because you know, there's more throughput now, so there's more space for the transaction. It's in the interest of business users because they see the actual thing getting adopted. And it's also in the interest of miners because the miners are, of course, mining um, for the purpose of grabbing the coin. And by being able to show continued utilization and continued adoption, um, it increases the utility of the network as well. Well, guys, this has been absolutely incredible. Again, thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, if people want to get a hold of you, I'm sure you guys are getting inundated with emails and trying to reach out, but what's the best way to contact you guys at this point if you're looking for, I'm assuming, hopefully very talented engineers, maybe some partnerships? How do we do that? Email, Telegram, I think. Probably yeah, we, we have our Telegram group. Uh, you know, There's our website, which has our contact info there, info at kadena.io. Um, and you know, just, just keep, keep your eyes posted. We're everywhere. Awesome, guys. Well, hey, thank you so much for taking the time today. And um, we're really looking forward to tracking the progress. Great. Thank, thank you. you.